My highlight during the Wittenberg gathering was the evening when a group of representatives from the historic churches asked all the present Anabaptist brothers and sisters for forgiveness for the sins that the Catholics, Lutherans, and Reformed committed against them. Thomas, you've just published a new book, Unity Through Repentance, and this evening we had a reading and presentation at, in the Baptist Church in the Molotgasse in Wien, in Vienna, about this book. Can you tell us just a little bit about the background to the book, what your purpose was in writing the book, and what you see as the next steps going forward, how you hope that this book might be an influence? Um, so the title, Unity Through Repentance, might be considered a heavy title. <laughs> it may sound like a book of theology, you know, unity through repentance. Ooh, those are two words that are hard, right? Both of them. Unity, what does that mean? How do we do it? Repentance, oh, who wants to go there? But the subtitle is The Journey to Wittenberg 2017. And so what I really want to say is this book is a story. It's not a book of theology. It's not a book of ideas. It's a book that tells a story. And I've had many people who have come and said, I was intimidated to start reading it, but then when I started, I couldn't stop. Because the story is not a story of me. It's not a story of my wife, Amy, or of this initiative even. What it really is is a story of God. And it's a story of how God very intentionally and against all odds uh, called a lay couple from Texas to think about having a commemoration in Wittenberg, Germany at the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. I mean, that makes no sense. It's kind of like God's joke. But, but God somehow decided to do it this way. And, uh, and the goal of the event was to repent to grieve the divisions in the church, and then to pray John 17 with Jesus. Because in John 17 is recorded the longest prayer of Jesus. It's the prayer he prayed before he went to the cross. So you've got to think, okay, this has some significance. It's the only prayer he prayed for us. So, Kim, he was praying for you and me when he prayed. And so what did he pray? Well, he could have prayed for anything. He could have prayed for missionary zeal for his people. Or he could have prayed for uh, correct doctrine or moral purity or care for the poor, or any, uh, any number of other things that are all good things and they're all things he taught, right? But when he prayed for us, he prayed that we would be one and not only that we would be one, but that the level of unity we would reach <laughs> is the unity between the Father and the Son. So we wanted to pray that in Wittenberg in 2017 at the place, kind of in the place and time of a division, say, no, no, we're going to join Jesus and we're going to pray for unity. You mentioned a few times Wittenberg 2017. Can you just explain or remind us briefly why the year 2017 was significant and why the place, Wittenberg, was significant for the meeting that you held there? I can, and in keeping with my style, I will tell you a story. So in the year 2000, my wife and I took an anniversary trip to Switzerland. And uh, it was our 10th anniversary. And Amy, my wife, was considering becoming Catholic. And so we were talking about this. It was not an easy decision. And so I grabbed the very romantic book, The History of the Reformation, to take with us on our anniversary trip. <laughs> and we read through much of uh, good parts of that book while we were together in Switzerland. And of all the things in the book, the one that jumped out at me was the Reformation dates from October 31st, 1517. So on that day, Martin Luther sent his 95 theses to Cardinal Albrecht in Mainz. 
Now, the legend is he nailed those theses to the door of the church in Wittenberg, right? Because Wittenberg is where Luther lived. Verena Long, an Austrian Catholic who you know, a historian, PhD, taught us, no, this is not true. There's no record in any of, during Luther's lifetime that he nailed these theses to the door. That was a, a story added later. Now, why is this important? It's important because both the Catholics and the Protestants take something unhealthy from this image. For the Protestants, I have the right to nail my theses on your church door, right? And so we again and again and again thrust our opinions of others' practices or doctrines in their face as if we were Martin Luther. Well, Martin Luther didn't do that. He correctly, as a prophet, submitted his prophetic message to his apostolic authority, the Bishop of Mines. So that is the correct way, if you have a prophetic message, to bring it is to bring it to the apostolic authority for consideration. So that's one problem. Second problem is from the Catholic side, because the Catholics look at that image and they say, oh, Martin Luther just wanted, he was just a rebel. He just wanted to split the church. Well, that's actually not true. He was a pious Augustinian monk. His intention in sending the theses was not at all to split the church. His intention in sending the theses was to start a discussion about whether or not this was a godly, the indulgences and the way they were being done in Germany was godly and biblical or not. And so it was, in fact, the Catholics who excommunicated him. Most Catholics don't kind of own up to that. They say Martin Luther split the church. Well, the Catholics excommunicated him, hoping he would go away, and he didn't go away. <laughs> and here we are today, right? So Wittenberg 1517 was the site of the start of the Protestant Reformation and a major division in the body of Christ. Wittenberg 2017 is 500 years after that. And so the question then was, okay, what's the appropriate way to come at this 500th anniversary, which is so significant? Do we celebrate and do rah-rah Luther and, you know, ha, take that, you Catholics? Or do we listen to the heart of Jesus, grieve, repent, and pray for unity? You mentioned in the book um, and a few times that the radical reformation, the so-called radical reformation, became an important part of the event in Wittenberg in 2017, and that it actually came a bit late in the planning process and a bit as a surprise to many of you. Could you just say a few words what you understand under the radical reformation and how it came about then that that became a, an important part of the Wittenberg experience. I'm glad you didn't ask me to say what is the Radical Reformation because I would have given the microphone back to you and say you could tell much better than I could <laughs> being a part of it. So my understanding of the Radical Reformation is that there was, in addition to the reformers, Calvinists, you know, Lutherans, etc., there was a group that said these these reformers are not going far enough because they remain intertwined with the state and the political powers. Whereas Jesus, particularly in the Sermon on the Mount, seems to call us to detach from those types of things and live a separate life. Um, and so these radical reformers, who came to be known as Anabaptists, um, uh, protested both in a sense, perhaps, but they didn't, as I understand it, didn't protest kind of in your face, but just tried to live the life that they felt God was calling them to live. But somehow living that life was a, was not, could not be stood and tolerated by either the Lutherans or the Catholics. And so there was a great amount of terrible persecution in Germany and Austria in these areas of uh, these Anabaptists and they were driven essentially from the land. And it was a, a terrible wound in the body of Christ added to the wound of the Reformation. And the split there is now this uh, you know, subsequent wound of the expulsion and persecution of the radical reformers. So there was some wise counsel uh, in the lead up to the last meeting 
um, because we had a series of six meetings, each one with their own theme of repentance. The council was, we can't end this initiative if we don't have repentance towards the radical reformers from the Lutherans and from the Catholics. And so that became the focus of repentance for the last meeting, and it was very, very powerful. And much has come from it that's told a little bit in the book, but which you could tell a lot more if you were the one being interviewed. <laughs> you also try with your wife and with other brothers and sisters to live out a radical discipleship. And can you tell us a little bit about your community, Christ the Reconciler, and what, how that came about and what you hope to, what you are experiencing and what you hope to experience in the building up in Elgin? Our statement of what we are about as a kind of foundational mission, we learned partly from the Anabaptists. So one of the things that struck me as I studied and the Anabaptist movement in preparation for that last meeting, because I didn't know much about it, was this idea to live out the Sermon on the Mount. For me, this is very clear, very clear, very simple statement, simple to say, but very profound and deep and difficult to do, right? And so I loved it. It was like, that's such a, and that combined with this idea of, of praying John 17 into what we say we want to do at Christ the Reconciler, which is live out John 17. So how do we do that? We do that because we're Catholics and Protestants who are all active members of our local churches. So Christ the Reconciler is not a church in the same way that Bruderhof is a church. We're not a church. We require that our members be active members of local Protestant, Catholic, or other streams of the body of Christ, and then we pray, work, show hospitality, uh, engage in spiritual formation, and do acts and initiatives of reconciliation together as a ecumenical body. So that's the goal. We're at the very beginning um, and have a lot to learn, and we have learned so much from the Bruderhof. I just have to say thank you because there is much that we have learned from the Bruderhof that has really gone deeply into who uh, the beginnings of our community that I think will bear fruit from for years to come. Are you also a community of hospitality? Do you welcome guests? Would it be possible for somebody who's interested to come and see what you're doing in, in Elgin? And if so, how would they make contact with you? Thank you. That's a very good question. The answer is yes. We love to have guests. And we've had many guests from around the nation, the United States, and around the world that have come and stayed with us. And so uh, we would welcome anyone that's interested, uh, certainly to come. I would say three things. One is um, come visit us. That's the best, right? Because there's nothing like being together face to face, sitting around a table, hearing each other's stories. And, you know, that's the best. Um, but there's other ways to connect as well. So we have a website, ChristTheReconciler.org. You can go to that website. There's a contact form. So if you were interested in coming to visit us, you could fill out that contact form and we would receive that. We also have an app, and I believe it's the first, as far as I know, it's the first, but it may still be the only app out there that's dedicated to reconciliation and unity in the body of Christ. And we publish daily, uh, a meme daily of encouragement, a daily story about reconciliation, a daily prayer. Every day those rotate, and then we have monthly uh, teachings and book reviews and different things that are all on this theme of unity and repentance. So that's another way to connect with what we're doing is just download the app. You can find it under Christ the Reconciler or go to our website and it's right there on the front page. And, uh, and if you have that, you can actually start praying along with us and getting a little sense of who we are and the kinds of things that the Lord has led us into. So thank you for all that you have done and are doing in support of the building up of God's kingdom. And thank you for the work that you do in Texas and also for coming, the work that you've done and are doing in Europe. Thank you for coming to Vienna and for your words and God's blessings on your continued journey.